Welcome to Recreate Parenting, the podcast from licensed therapist and author Roya Dato. We're going to talk about creative tools for more connection so that you can release fear and find joy in all of the places your kids take you. This podcast is especially wonderful for those of you who feel like your families don't quite fit the mold. All right, everyone. This one is titled Six-Year-Old Manipulating Consequences. My six-year-old son tries to turn consequences into pity parties for himself, and I'm so torn on what to do. He's an only child, but very close with his younger cousins. They're at our home a lot. They're more like siblings. They typically play together quite well, but my son has always had a hard time keeping his hands to himself, sometimes really bad stuff like punching, hair pulling, or pinching. When he gets physical with one of his cousins, usually play-related disputes, we take the cousin away from the game and say, we won't let you hurt your cousin. He then proceeds to get really upset, cry, scream, etc., and then immediately goes into, I need a hug, I need a hug. Now, I understand that he's upset and is looking for help regulating, but I'm soothing or caring for the hurt friend at that point. His consequence is that we have left the game and his general area because he couldn't keep his hands to himself, and he now wants me to comfort and snuggle him through his consequence, defeating the consequence altogether. While a big part of me wants to sit with him and comfort him, it really feels like manipulation too. It feels like he doesn't want to be in trouble and that he wants to make the situation all about him. I feel like he shouldn't get to hurt someone and then get a hug. Any thoughts? I have to say, this is a situation that I really wish I could see in action. Sometimes hearing the story through the parent's lens is difficult to see what's happening because the parent lens is, shall we say, colored by their experiences. You know, it's colored by our fears. Maybe that's a more accurate way of putting it. Um, this parent is worried that their six-year-old is being manipulative. And so that is part of how I'm going to go ahead and say she, that's, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, that's part of how she's viewing it is that this kid, uh, is manipulating her for something that he wants, um, even when he's done something physical to another kid. So I, I really wish I could see it in action. <laughs> that's one of the things that I enjoy quite a lot about getting to do telehealth sessions at home now. Um, like since, you know, since the pandemic and we all started moving to video calls, I feel like I get to see a little bit better, even sometimes how family dynamics work because my clients are often in their own homes, you know, and so I'll get to see a little bit more of that. Sometimes that's what therapy is about. It's having someone from an outside perspective, be able to view the situation and just be like, all right, so, uh, from someone who doesn't have your upbringing or your messaging or your fears, here's what it seems like is happening to me, you know? So that's part of it. I really do wish I could see what was going on with this family. I do, th I don't know quite how to say this next piece. I do think that she's right in a sense. Like she says, a big part of me wants to sit in comfort with him. It feels like manipulation. It feels like he doesn't want to be in trouble and that he wants to make the situation all about him. Now, I think those are two different things, not wanting to be in trouble and then making the situation all about him. And I don't, again, that's one of those things where I'm not sure because I'm not there watching it, but certainly that first part, do you know a kid who wants to be in trouble ever, <laughs> you know? So yes, is he looking for ways to try to get out of whatever trouble means? hundred percent. That is very human. We all do that to some degree. If we walk ourselves into a situation that is unpleasant or uncomfortable, it is like our goal at that point to try to walk ourselves out. So in that sense, if that's what you're calling manipulation, then I don't necessarily think that it's like a negative malicious thing. One of the things that's worrying me a little bit about everything that this woman has written is that her language is all about consequence and punishment. It just reads very punitive. And I can only imagine that if this kid has had very black and white like punishments for different behaviors, that it will absolutely exacerbate his desire to avoid that punishment. And he will try whatever has even a little bit worked before to get out of that consequence. And this mom is reading hugs as him winning, right? So the way that she's even talking about the situation 
has a very divisive feeling. It feels very much like a win for this kid would be a loss for her in some way. And so I think that's a big part of this is anytime when you're talking about your kids or you're talking about a situation involving your kids and you start to recognize language that feels divisive, you're using words like battle or conflict or any time that it feels like they're on a team and you're on a team, I think that's a really good indicator to stop for a minute and recognize that and think about what would this look like or how would I talk about it if being on the same team was my goal. I do have one practical piece of advice for this parent, which is that you need to be more there. <laughs> if they're playing normally pretty well, but every once in a while it's this bad, then you don't get to leave. You know, you do have to stay much closer because I promise you, even if it feels like it goes from perfect to terrible in the span of half a second, if you're there, that's how you figure out what the cues and the clues are for what it looks like when it ramps up, even if it ramps up really fast. And so part of your job is to be there to see the warning signs to intervene before it gets to the physical place, before it gets to the part where you feel like you have to administer consequences. By letting it play out in the way that it is according to this uh, this text, you've basically done this like triangulation thing is what we call it, where there's a bad guy, a victim, and a hero. And you know, the, the cousin is the victim and the kid is the bad guy and you're the hero. And doing that, pulling your, your kids into that weird triangle, it just doesn't feel good for anybody, you know? So I think then what's happening is this kid is recognizing now that like he's the bad guy and you're off rescuing the cousin and he's trying to align you back with him. He's trying to get you back on his side. Yeah, I guess that's manipulation because he's actively trying to make you do or feel a thing. I just don't think it comes out of maliciousness. I think it comes out of a very real need for this very young kid to have his parent be on his side. And I don't think your six-year-old should hit or kick or pull his cousin's hair, you know? So that's part of why I think that you need to be there more, be there sooner, be a detective, pay attention to all the signs of things. And it might mean you don't play as long as you have been, you know, maybe they're great for four and a half hours and at four hours and 35 minutes, something goes wrong. Then maybe the next play date is only two hours, you know, just to completely avoid it, just to set up some successes, avoid, you know, change the proportions of those experiences a little bit. So you have more time in between these kinds of incidences happening. If you stop things before they get physical and escalate then too, then you can respond to the need that he's asking for before he does the thing that you don't want to hug him for, right? So the last line of this, she says, I feel like he shouldn't get to hurt someone and then get a hug. So give him a lot of hugs before that. That means you have to be there and you have to be paying attention. You have to end the play date sooner than maybe you even want to. And then you have to fill in those hugs before it happens give him those and, and use other examples too. other bad feelings. It doesn't all have to, you know, do with just this one experience. Other things will scaffold and generalize into this. So if you know that getting a hug, you know, that physical touch is part of how he feels soothed, go ahead and take that opportunity every chance you get. You just get to be there and prevent it from involving a physical thing happening with his cousins or his friends. I also need to make a distinction here between a natural consequence and a parent-imposed consequence. Because a natural consequence is, like, I can't pay attention to you right now because I'm dealing with a crisis over here. But as soon as that thing has resolved itself and you continue to not go over and attend to your kid, that's a choice that you're making. And I'm all for parents making those choices if that's what you want, but that's not necessarily like a normal consequence or not a normal consequence, a natural consequence. And your kid is well aware of the fact that you are making the choice at that point. I also want to put in a plug for the fact that it is okay to soothe a little kid who's having big feelings. Our thoughts, our behaviors, and our feelings are three related but different things. So just because you can sit and soothe the feeling of your kid, that doesn't mean you're saying that that behavior that was based on that feeling is appropriate or okay. You get to address those three things as three distinctly different things also. So I don't think it's a terrible thing once you've dealt with the hurt person to go back over to that kid and give him a hug 
And you can hug the feeling and still talk about the behavior that got you there. Those are different things. It's not always easy to change a feeling or a thought. Sometimes it's easier to change a behavior first and let the other two kind of follow. Sometimes it's easier to replace a thought and let those other two things, you know, shift as a result. They are connected, which is great news. Different situations will have a different, you know, in route to, to making some change. But it's okay to take the road offered, especially when they're six. Because the truth is, even if he was the one who was doing the hitting or whatever, he does need attention. <laughs> that is absolutely what he needs right then. It might not look exactly like what he's asking for, but he needs attentiveness from you. I think he needed it 20 minutes ago, but he needs attentiveness from you. I do believe in triaging though. Physical safety first, emotional safety second. So I would be doing that with the, the hurt kid, making sure they're physically safe, making sure they're emotionally safe. And then you get to go to your kid and handle their emotional safety, right? But all of this can be done out loud. And ideally you can, again, put some more space between these occasions, be more present so you can stop things as they ramp up, shorten the play dates so you don't have, you know, quite so many opportunities for it. And then use lesser examples as a way to give more of that physical soothing, as a way to talk about behavior and feeling um, and thought links, as a way to talk about what happens when we get upset, as a way to substitute some other behaviors in there for the hitting and the you know punching and all of that. You can use other less extreme things to help impart some of those moments. So that way you've practiced if and when this happens again. And then check your own soul, <laughs> your own messaging about the idea of your kid being manipulative and what that means. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Recreate Parenting Podcast. As always, I want to invite you to set aside and honor some time for creativity every single week by joining the Play With Purpose monthly membership group. You can find information about that and everything else I've got to offer for you creative parents at royadato.com. That's R-O-Y-A-D-E-D-E-A-U-X.com.